Ann told me this would be a serious evening <laughs> and that I should play it that way. She also told me Tom was going to be here, so I knew she wasn't telling the whole truth. <laughs> I really am not quite sure how to pitch this now. It's been an unusual evening, and it's hard to figure out quite what to do, so I, what I'm going to do is what I was going to do anyway, and we'll just let the chips fall where they will. I'm. I'm sure you must know deeply honored that ACTA selected me for this year's Philip Merrill Award. It is uh, something that is right in my wheelhouse, so to speak, in terms of addressing things that mean a great deal to me. Uh, teaching does mean a great deal to me, and the liberal arts mean a great deal to me. So this brings together things that have been very important to me for my whole career, and to have friends and colleagues uh, stand up and say the things they've said is sort of hard to listen to on one level, it's, it's, but immensely rewarding as well. Anne very gently urged me not to transgress the boundary of 20 minutes, and I'm not going to do so because we're running a little bit later than we were anyway. But I am going to say some things. What I'm not going to do is talk about the state of liberal arts in America. I'm in a room where people care passionately about it. You know what's going on. Pay attention to what's going on. So I don't need to recount what the newspapers are saying or what anyone else is saying other than to observe that the pronouncements about the fate of liberal arts now run the gamut from guardedly optimistic to Cassandra-like. Uh, you pick which one you want and you can find it and then we move on. What winning this award prompted me to do is something that I'm a little chagrined to admit I've never done before, and that is to think seriously about teaching. I've never sat down and thought about it systematically. I've never taken a course on pedagogy. I've never been mentored in any kind of systematic way about teaching. At any stage of my career, I've always taught at research universities, uh, an environment where scholarship and publishing far more than effectiveness in the classroom usually decide whether or not someone will get tenure, whether or not they'll be promoted, what the arc of their career will end up being. It's a culture where the notion that one can either be a good teacher or a good scholar, but probably not both, still lingers. And I think that notion is completely wrong-headed. Scholarship and effectiveness in communicating ideas in the classroom as well as to lay audiences beyond the classroom are absolutely inextricably linked. Success in the classroom and in public forums rests to a significant degree on the process and on the excitement of bringing material and insights derived from our research into lectures and other programs for students and others interested in history. The process keeps courses fresh, imparts an organic quality that yields continuing dividends. It's been my experience that superior scholars often make superior teachers, and that the two have a great deal to do with one another. They in no way are inimical to one another, and I even think there are enough people who are really good scholars and really good teachers about to fill almost every position at colleges and universities. They're just not in all of them right now, but I think there are enough of them to fill those positions, and I think if someone isn't doing those things, they should just get the hell out <laughs> and make room for somebody who can do both uh, because they are around. I'm going to spend the rest of my time tonight on a mostly positive note, which is unlike me, as Will and Joan and others, uh, Peter Carmichael over there could say, I tend to be a little gloomy sometimes because I want things to be just right, and they're not always just right, it's infuriating. <laughs> I am unbelievably fortunate to work in an endlessly fascinating field. No part of our history is more consequential than the era of the American Civil War. I know some of you have had classes, taken courses, talked to people who might have told you otherwise, they are confused. <laughs> the American Civil War is it. If you don't come to terms with the American Civil War, if you don't understand what's going on in the mid-19th century, you have no chance of understanding the broader trajectory of United States history. Not a slim chance, no chance, absolutely none. Worry about something else uh, if you're not going to come to terms with the American Civil War. 
The mid-19th century offers a profusion of dramatic scenes and compelling personalities and unlikely political and social twists and turns and by far the most disruptive military event in our history. Nothing else even close. As a society and a people, Americans of the period grappled with elemental questions, absolutely elemental. Would the union forged by the revolutionary generation be scuttled just because part of the electorate wasn't happy with the person who was elected to the presidency? Nobody accused Abraham Lincoln of cheating. They just didn't like the fact that Abraham Lincoln won. If you dismantle the nation because of that, then of course the aristocrats and oligarchs and monarchists and all others who said people could not govern themselves would be right. It won't work. Let us tell you what's best for you, and we'll move along. Would the institution of slavery, which had mocked the soaring language of our foundational documents for the Republic's entire history, be eliminated? Would the relative power of the central government and the states and the localities be reoriented in a fundamental way? And most important by far, by far, would the nation emerge intact positioned to become an economic and military colossus that would wield unmatched power in the 20th century. Confederate victory in the war, something surely possible, though few Americans appreciate that fact now, would have altered the trajectory of the 20th century. What richer material could anyone have to teach? I believe it takes an act of will to make this subject boring. <laughs> it is possible, alas. But to do so roughly compares to being handed the keys to a Lamborghini and then deciding to drive it around in a Walmart parking lot at 15 miles an hour. It's just about where you are. I find a real hunger for substantive engagement with the Civil War among undergraduates, graduates, lay audiences, and groups of high school and middle school teachers with whom I work every year. As has already been noted, so much has already been noted, some of my best things have already been scooped by other people. I do teach at 8 in the morning. I do. I don't want weaklings in my class. I want someone who can, by God, get up in the morning and drag themselves to class I read the St. Crispin's Day speech from Henry V and tell them that the people who get up and actually are in class every morning are going to have a bond going forward because they will have done something that the other people couldn't do <laughs> and they can just look at them with a knowing you couldn't, I did, who's better? <laughs> It's not necessary to try to entertain any of these constituencies with bells and whistles, quite the contrary. I'm something of a Luddite uh, when it comes to technology. No PowerPoint, the devil spawned. <laughs> no links to the internet. Not even slides or overheads. I don't even embrace late 19th century technology. <laughs> All you need is chalk and a blackboard and engaging people with what you are telling them and drawing them in so that they have a sense of communal purpose here. We're doing this together. We're going to get to the end of this. And when we get to the end, we're going to know something. And we're going to understand something and something that is very important. All my classes and presentations, Mel alluded to this, combine attention to both history and historical memory. I push students to master what actually happened. I think something actually happened. And I think it's important to learn that history is not merely a series of artificial constructions. This is happening. Something is happening here. This is happening. You came. You sat. We're talking. You're listening. It's not historical, but it is history. Now, you'll all go home and remember this differently. Some of you may need minor counseling. Some of you may not. Some of you may have happy memories from this. Some of you less happy memories. My point is they're not the same thing. It's actually happening. We'll remember it differently. It's absolutely essential that students understand that, that they understand that. And they understand that memory often trumps reality because we act according to what we perceive to have been the past. And we gain those perceptions from a variety of sources. 
For my Civil War-related classes, I have the most splendid materials at hand to illustrate the power of memory. They watch films, never in class, always outside of class, to gauge how Hollywood has interpreted the past. They write papers that compare celluloid treatments to assigned readings and my lectures. I take them on battlefield tours, as you've probably heard too much about. Uh, but they get on those sites. There is no better classroom, no better classroom than a historic site. You can get, you can draw people in to another time. You can talk about not only what they can see, but you can talk about what the framework for what happened there was. Why are the soldiers there? What was at stake? What did people think was at stake? They're just the most marvelous places to take people. And if you can go stand on a battlefield, if you can go to Antietam and not feel anything, then move to New Zealand. <laughs> because these places should have the ability to draw you in. They absolutely should. And my experience has been that they almost always do. I believe in narrative. I believe in chronology. I believe in biography. I think they're all essential to forging a true understanding of the past. These are unfashionable tools. Uh, in many quarters today, but I've seen the confusion that results from purely thematic or theoretical approaches to history, most notably from those devoid of human beings. <laughs> there are actually human beings in history, and students make it that that's one of the best ways for them to forge a connection to the past. Situate humans in the past, and it works very well. For too many students, even very bright ones, they arrive in college with a hopeless muddle of information about American history. An affirmation of this sad fact came a few months ago when one of my students provided a link. Students know that I can barely function uh, in the world of the internet, so they point me toward things in a really kind of gentle way. Here, you should look at this, Mr. Gallagher. We're sure you didn't. <laughs> They gave me a link to something called Lunch Scholars on YouTube, and it offered a series of interviews with high school students, several of whom responded to this question. In what war did the United States gain its independence? Now, I love the Civil War, but my heart fell when I learned that the most obvious, most common answer was the Civil War. <laughs> the Korean War got one vote. <laughs> That's even more heartbreaking. <laughs> Chronology in history not only matters, it is an essential beginning point. The bombardment of Fort Sumter followed the secession of the Lower South, which came after the election of Abraham Lincoln. You don't just get to scramble things and put them in any order you want. One thing follows another. And if you don't understand that, you major in sociology, <laughs> but don't come to history. And I apologize to every sociologist in the room. It's a fine discipline. <laughs> Most students enroll in classes to learn something about a subject. They typically resent being held hostage to harangues regarding contemporary politics. And I find this encouraging that they don't like that. We all have our political views, but I think we should check them at the classroom door. Don't applaud. I'm running out of time. <laughs> for example, for example, how I vote, and I do vote. I voted on Tuesday. I had a little sticker that said, I voted. <laughs> I walked around with it and looked at people. Did you vote? <laughs> and if you don't vote, keep your mouth shut. You don't get to complain if you don't vote. That's the rule. Hear, hear. I love this table over here. They're right on top of things. How I vote, how I vote has nothing to do, nothing to do with how I try to explain why men from New Hampshire or from New <coughs> Wisconsin or from Iowa who were at absolutely no risk from any Confederate army ever coming anywhere near them, why would those men put on blue uniforms and risk their lives to save the Union? If students emerge from my class not knowing the answer to that, I have failed completely. Failed completely. Injecting my own political views into the process would only get in the way. I find it, again, heartening when at the close of almost every semester, one or two or three or four, sometimes they come in little clumps of students will come up and say that they couldn't tell 
during the semester whether I'm a Democrat or a Republican. And then they'll say, but the semester's over, Mr. Gallagher, will you tell us now? And I tell them no. That's exactly what I want them to know about my politics. Nothing. Because my politics do not in any way relate to what I want them to get out of a class. Absolutely not in any way. I'm going to close by observing that a gratifying number of my students come to understand why we, all of us, as American citizens, should care about our history. We should care because an understanding of history is vital in a democratic republic that functions best with the type of informed citizenry the founding generation believed was necessary for any successful experiment in self-government. That sounds so hackneyed. I know it does. It's true. It's absolutely true. Ignorance about the American past gets in the way of fruitful public debate about current issues of surpassing importance. This ignorance affects what passes for discussion of politics and other issues on the 24-hour news channels, on the internet, and in newspapers. A shrill tone often predominates in all of these settings, frequently set up by analysis, put that in quotation marks, that is strikingly uninformed. The news emerges from a world of hyperbolic froth, where everything reported is the worst, the biggest, the best, unprecedented in our history. I think there must be a course somewhere, never saw it at Penn State or UVA, but it may be there, titled Hyperbole 101, <laughs> and perhaps another one titled, quote, The Long Reach of History from Last Thursday to Today. <laughs> I say this because the grasp of history as it exists in much of the media typically extends back approximately a week. I think the media often engage the world in much the same way as little Labrador puppies. Every day brings a fresh adventure in discovery. I'm gonna chew a leg. No one's ever chewed a chair leg before. It's brand new. I think that if we weren't so untethered to our own history, if we had some sense of a longer perspective, uh, there would be context and buffering in place when we try to engage with issues now. Political discussion suffers especially from a lack of historical framing. The handling of immigration, for example, betrays little appreciation for the fact that we have engaged in similar debates throughout our history. Or that the vitriol characteristic of those debates make the current ones look tame. Often lost is awareness that percentages of foreign-born residents are not remarkably high right now. If we were looking at the loyal population in 1861, of the entire military age loyal population, 30% had been born outside the United States. And in every decade from 1860 through 1920, the percentage of foreign born citizens in the United States was higher than it is now. I don't hear that a lot when people are yelling at each other about immigration. It's as if it's never, we're just encountering this, oh my God. We're not as well, unusually, I'm almost finished, divided politically in the early 21st century, though you would never know it if you habitually watch again. I'll beat up on the 24-hour news channels, and I beat up on all of them. I don't discriminate among this one or that one or that one. I put them all in the same lumpy pile and beat up on them together. Never mind blogs. <laughs> but this even happens in, I think, much of the mainstream newspaper and other media coverage. Rants about how divided we are do not help set the stage for rational consideration of problems following our, or excuse me, facing our nation. A leitmotif in coverage of the 2008 presidential election and of subsequent political campaigns and wrangles in Washington and the hinterlands suggests that we are witnessing a unique breakdown of national civility and that criticism of the president, whether George W. Bush or Barack Obama, has reached a new level of intensity. The only way you can argue these things is if you don't know anything about American history. I strongly suspect that Abraham Lincoln or John Adams or many other presidents, for that matter, would find political criticism directed toward our recent presidents rather tame. In fact, I think Abraham Lincoln would say, tell me again what his worst day was. I want that day every day. That's the day I want every day. 
As for our never having been so divided, historians of the Civil War can counter with at least one obvious example <laughs> that puts the lie to that notion. <laughs> My point is simply that if we as a people had a more certain sense of our history, we would be in a better position to know that almost nothing is new, that we've overcome immense problems in the past, and that we almost certainly will do so again. One last thing I try to impress on my students is the value of finding a profession that stirs passionate interest over the long term. I've had the great good fortune to teach at Penn State and at UVA to earn my living lecturing and writing about the Civil War. I look forward to every class period. I still do. Even the ones at 8 o'clock. I kind of like those the best. Uh, the ones that I like to watch the students straggle in. Some of them still in their pajamas. A number of the guys I know have not been to bed yet. <laughs> They'll take care of that after the 8 o'clock class. <laughs> They're there. They become focused after a little while. I have access to a great library superior students, major historic sites, and a campus in Charlottesville that absolutely exudes history. Because of the wide popularity of my field, I have the opportunity to reach people beyond academia. I wouldn't trade jobs with anyone in the United States, and I'm well aware of how few people can say that and mean it. Thank you.